Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the third episode of Bar Broians, a podcast exploring the cinematic oeuvre, library, legacy, I'm not quite sure what to call it, of the Barbarian Brothers. Joining me, as always, is my bro, JD. What up, Noel? What up? We are being joined today by a very special guest. Everyone, please welcome my old co-host for my Halo of Remakes, Evie. Hello! Yay, Evie! Evie, how are you? I am really good. I know I've recorded with both of you over the last year, but I think this is the first time that I've recorded with both of you together since we did Fright Night. Which For real? Which had to have been like four or five years ago or something like that. It's been a while. I need to rewatch Fright Night. But we're not here to discuss Fright Night today. We are here to discuss Peter Paul and David Paul, the Barbarian Brothers. And I have to ask you, Evie, before this podcast series, had you ever seen any of the films featuring the Barbarian Brothers before? I don't think so. Like, maybe out of the periphery of my childhood when I was super sugared up on something, but I don't think I have. And had you ever heard of them? I didn't know them by name, but I've probably seen a picture or something like that. But I don't think before you told me about doing the podcast, I didn't know really, like, who they were. So this is your introduction to the Barbarian Brothers. Yes, and it was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, and then that should go ahead and lead us into this is the third of the four films in which the Barbarian Brothers were the lead stars. This is Double Trouble from 1992. So with Double Trouble, I'm not really going to get into the producers because it's mostly the entire group of producers who also did Think Big. So this one like led right out of the last movie. But the writing credits are kind of interesting how it's like story by Kurt Wimmer and Charles Osborne, written by Kurt Wimmer, Charles Osborne, and Jeffrey Kearns, screenplay by Jeffrey Kearns. So it's both written by and has screenplay by. I don't know why. (laughs) And then just to kind of break down those credits a bit, Kurt Wimmer and Charles Osborne, this was their very first film that they wrote. They would go on to write a horror movie called Wolves, which I'm not familiar with the mid 90s, I think, direct the video horror movie. And then Kurt Wimmer broke off and has had a very, very interesting career. He kept writing films like The Neighbor and Relative Fear, and then became like a really top Hollywood go-to screenwriter doing Sphere, The Thomas Crown Affair, The Recruit, Street Kings, Law Abiding Citizen, Salt, and the remakes of Total Recall and Point Break, and is the writer and director of his own original projects, Equilibrium and Ultraviolet. Oh, Ultraviolet. Oh, that movie. I remember Equilibrium. See, and I've only seen Ultraviolet, too. I keep meaning to see Equilibrium. Equilibrium was okay. I mean, it's not great, but it's a decent enough watch. Gun cutter. But Ultraviolet was a bad film. Well, it's worth pointing out, Ultraviolet was 12 years ago. He has not directed since. Still in movie jail. So, again, the writer of all those and the director of those two, this is his feature screenplay debut. Interesting. Just process that for a moment. Yeah, yeah. And then the director of the film is John Paragon. Now, would I be correct in assuming that you guys maybe grew up on Pee Wee's Playhouse back when you were kids? Yes. Not really. I think the first time I've heard about Pee Wee Herman is when he became very infamous. Right. <laughs> I was a weird kid. Like, that's what I was interested in. Was What's horrible happening in the world? Mm. But no, I, I never watched the show. I knew of the show, but I was just like, it didn't interest me as a kid. Okay. Then J.D., as you saw the show, you might know that John Paragon, the director of this, played Jombie the Genie, Ooh. the floating head in a box on <laughs> Pee-wee's Playhouse. He was also one of the main writers and directors throughout all the various Pee-wee incarnations. He's even involved in the most recent movie that just came out. I don't know if you remember the character of Miss Yvonne from that show, too, the woman next door that Pee-wee always had a big crush on. Yeah, I think so. It's been a long time since I've watched any of that. She had like a big beehive and all that stuff. That's right, yeah. Did you notice in this movie there is this one female cop with kind of short blonde hair and always wearing the full police suit? She pops up in a few scenes. Right, with the Girl Scout cookies, yeah. That's Miss Yvonne. Oh, wow. I would not have recognized her at all. 
John Paragon, he was also one of the main writing collaborators of Elvira. Kind of explains why there's kind of a similar feel to Pee-wee and Elvira. And he also co-wrote all of the Elvira movies. And he still, again, to this day, collaborates with both Elvira and Pee-wee. And he's directed a good handful of other TV shows, primarily Silk Stockings. He's only ever directed two feature films. This is the first... And the second is Twin Sitters, which we'll be covering on the next episode. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Yeah. Begin and end his directing career with the Barbarian Brothers. Otherwise, I don't really have any other production history on this one. I don't have a prepared synopsis, but I think I might be able to put one together (laughs) on the fly. (laughs) Because I know it's a very complicated plot with lots of overlapping threads and twists and turns. Yes. I couldn't tell you what the plot of the film is, so my hat is off to you, sir. Basically, evil mastermind Philip Chamberlain wants to rob a vault full of billions of dollars worth of diamonds. There are two electronic key cards that will allow access to this vault. One of those key cards has landed in the hands of Peter Jade, a bodybuilder slash cat burglar, who is also the identical twin brother of David Jade, a bodybuilder slash cop. Since bad guys think these two people are actually one person, they start going after both brothers to try to get the key card back. David's cop partner gets killed and set up for a bad drug bust. Everyone keeps attacking them left and right. And the two brothers, the cop and the thief, are forced to team up and work together by their police sergeant, Jimmy Doohan, and have to go and take the bad guys down. And what ensues is basically a plot that you could have put any stars in and have any director do. And it would have been Bad Boys. It would have been a Rennie Harlan film. It would have been anything. But it ended up with the Barbarian Brothers as overseen by John B. the Genie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so jd yes do you recommend double trouble Ah, uh, there are things i love about this film i will say this is probably the weakest of the three barbarian films we've watched so far i have trouble recommending it because the plot is it's not nonsensical it's just it's so simplistic it doesn't register <laughs> yeah it doesn't really register it's a little atonal at times like at times wants to be that 90s cop comedy like beverly hills cop And sometimes it has hints of a really serious cop drama that should not at all attempt that type of story at all. When it's being fun and light and fluffy, it's fun. When it's trying to be a little serious, which it dips its toes into one, maybe too many times, I just can't take it seriously. I'm going to give it a slight not recommend. Evie, do you recommend Double Trouble? Look, listen. This movie is delightful, and I'm not even being, like, fucking sarcastic. It's probably because I had a really good day at work yesterday, and I was just really happy when I got home, and I watched it in, like, perfect frame of mind. It completely worked for me, and I loved it. I am aware that this is not, like, high comedy, but not everything has to be. Peter and David, they have a really good chemistry together. They play off of each other really well, and it was really fun, and I liked it. And I'm not even sorry. Don't be sorry. And I think I just broke it all with that because he's just like, what? <laughs> no, you aren't. Hey, I should point out, we recommended the last two films, both of us. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, good. Because I was just like, am I going to be the only one who recommends this? I'm not going to be sorry, but like, it's going to be crazy if I am. <laughs> Seriously. Hey, you missed out when you didn't check on my link that I sent you for Think Big. Well, I'm going to have to go watch it now. I'm kind of on the fence on this one. I don't think it's as good as the last two. Because I think what was so nice about the last two was they were so built around the strength of the brothers. And both you and I, J.D., we really enjoyed the brothers and their type of energy and their stick and all stuff. Mm -hmm. I thought those films really knew how to build on that. This film, you have moments where it lets them be that, but there's so many moments where it's trying to fit them into a different kind of movie. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's really interesting and fun. Sometimes it clashes. Yeah. Sometimes it looks about as comfortable as these guys look in tailored suits. (laughs) It just doesn't quite come together. And yet, I still had fun with it. There are still a lot of interesting, quirky bits. I think had they had a project that they could just develop as a pure action comedy, they would have had more fun than taking what feels like it was more of a slick, serious, gritty cop and thief having to pair up action movie and trying to make a comedy out of it. It feels like this started as one thing and then they're trying to make it into another and they're not quite pulling it off. That said, I think once you get past the first half hour, when the two brothers are finally like forced together and it's a lot of scenes of them playing off each other, I think it actually becomes a lot of fun. And even beyond the brothers, there's some really fun shtick that I really enjoy throughout the film, especially with the villains. 
Here's how I'll classify the recommend. Evie's reaction aside, this is not what I would use as someone's first Barbarian Brothers movie. Because I think the Barbarians and Think Big are much of a better, like, here's a perfect introduction to here's why the Barbarian Brothers. And this one is a little clashy and all over the place. But if you enjoy the Barbarian Brothers, then yeah, there's enough of that stick that I think you can enjoy it. I think that's entirely fair. Mm -hmm. So moving into open discussion, Evie, we'll go ahead and just let you lead us off. So what do you think of the brothers and their style of comedy and performance? Like, I'm aware that they're not the best actors, but they're having so much fun. And I'm so into that. I can't really even put it into words because I'm aware that I'm watching people who are not very good actors, but I don't know. They're so earnest and so sweet and just, ugh. What were some of your favorite bits? Weird. Okay. This is not even really a bit, but the kitty litter in the sink yes. cracked me up so hard. Especially when he goes to the cat, just use the sink. Sink, yeah. <laughs> I was like sad that we never got to see that cat again. I was like, yeah. oh, no more cat. But it's one of those things where I'm just like, it's not that the script needed it. It's just, I was like, oh, the kitty. He probably gave it to Whitney. Either that or it just like hung out with him later when he came home. So JD, how do you feel about the Barbarian Brothers in this one kind of as compared to the last few? Well, one of the things that we said in both the Barbarians and in Think Big was that the brothers were not really ever differentiated at all. Yeah. Like one might be wearing a tank top or a slightly different costume, but they didn't really have any defining traits. And I do appreciate that they actually took some time. Like Dave is the crop top cop. <laughs> He's the serious angry one. And Peter is the cat burglar who dresses up in Cyclops cosplay when we first meet him. And he's the more jokey, less serious one. And I appreciate that he actually took effort to differentiate their characters because I always felt it bad. Like, they're interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of them got the girl in the last one, but I couldn't tell you which one was which other than that. So at least I appreciate that they actually did put some effort in that. I agree with what Evie said and that they are just a delight together. They always seem to bring a fun energy. When they're by themselves, the film's not really that good. This film, more than any of the other ones, actually separates them quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, not a whole lot. Well, especially, again, for mostly our first half hour. For the first act, yeah. <laughs> they're doing their own thing, and that's the weakest part of it, is when they're not together, the film just kind of suffers. But they're fun. I love these guys, and I'm still glad we get the chance to talk about them in this podcast. Give me one second. I'm registering the trademark for Crop Top Cop. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about that costume? Because just perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like ridiculous, but so perfect. That sweater that's just a little too small. And I love how they call it out. It's like, oh, you're putting on that ratty sweatshirt again. And then, yeah, you have the whole thing where the other brother just loves the tailored suits. And then we have to force the other brother into the tailored suit that one time. Oh, God. And he's walking around like he's lurched from Adam's family because he's just so yeah. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. I love these guys, but with their physiques, they look like inflated parade floats. You know, when they're in suits. Especially when they then have these guys hold their guns with the two hand stance out front. So much tissue is mooshing together there. <laughs> But to JD's point, this is a film where, hey, I think I finally have down which brother is which. Because, you know, one is slightly taller, slightly leaner in the face. The other is a little shorter, a little smirkier, a little more frequently jokier. And this one finally, by actually naming the characters David and Peter, I kind of now actually have a distinction in my head. And even looking back in the other films, OK, that one was David and that one was Peter. Yeah, yeah, I kind of thought that, too. Part of my problem with this film is while we do have a lot of great bits where they still play off each other, even in the scenes that they're together, there's still a lot of it where it's shot reverse shot. Cutting no close up of one, cutting no close up of the other. I think what we learned in the last two movies is these are two actors that you just put them both in the same shot. Even around whatever conversation they're having, they'll just have little physical bits of business that they'll bounce off of each other. By separating them in their own individual shots, even when they're in scenes together, you don't get that interplay. Yeah, I noticed that too. Like there's a few scenes where because they do that shot reverse shot thing, if I didn't know for the fact that they were twin brothers, like I would almost think, oh, this is the trick that they use to like hide the fact it's one actor. Mm -hmm. It's the parent trap method. <laughs> right. Or Patty Duke. Oh, how come they never did a parent trap starring the Barbarian Brothers? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want that. <laughs> Oh my god, that hurts so much now. <laughs> trying to get their parents back together. Oh, I'm upset. <laughs> While they're in their 30s. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And I think they were pushing 40 by the time they made this movie. Yeah. Because I remember they were born in the mid-50s. 
that said, there is still good banter between them when they get to play off each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, one of my favorite sequences, because it's such a pure Barbarian Brothers sequence, is the bits where they're harassing the politician in the tanning booth and then following him around and pranking him in other ways and then ultimately ending it with flipping his car on its head. Yeah. That's perfect Barbarian Brothers dick. My favorite thing between the two brothers is when Peter escapes being handcuffed to the steering wheel, takes the wheel off the car yes. and goes and finds his brother. And then later on, they go back to the car to give chase to the bad guys. And then they look down and they're like, oh, yeah, the steering wheel, I took that off. And I love how he's just <laughs> staring at him. He's just staring at him like, fuck you. Just whistles innocently. <laughs> the whistling. I love the whistling. Well, I also love when Peter would just kind of do the pouty face. Be like, oh, am I hurting your pee? <laughs> 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 they do have fun off each other, and I do like that there's a difference in the characterization. David, I kind of like that he's a little more stoic, even if he's not fully pulling off the bits where he's mourning his slain partner. What I always give the brothers credit for is they're trying. They're not flat. They're not wooden. Even when they're not pulling it off, you can see they are putting effort into it. They are expressing. They are acting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Evie, what did you think of Roddy McDowell as the bad guy? Weirdly, like, it kind of threw me off because I'm used to, like, all the old movies. Like, anything I've seen with him in it, he's not usually the bad guy. No, he's usually the plucky supporting comedy character. Exactly. So for me, I was just like, I'm sorry, my mind is blown. It's the opposite of when I watched Sherlock Holmes with Christopher Lee and hid behind the couch for a half hour <laughs> because I was terrified. And then I'm like, okay, he's not going to kill anyone. We're fine. <laughs> Did not trust him for like a half hour. I always love Roddy McDowell and everything. I have to agree. I can't think of too many times I've seen him be a villain. But to be honest, give him a better script than this. I think he would have been like a perfectly good Bond villain. Oh, yeah. He's got a class to him. He takes a little bit of joy in his evilry. He's so chipper. Yeah, exactly. He apologizes. Oh, I'm sorry. I owe you an apology when he finds that there actually is two brothers that are identical. And he's like, oh, I guess you didn't steal this. Oh, I owe you an apology. Kill them both. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I kind of wish his plot was a little bit... It's not that it's too complicated. It's just the whole trail that the brothers have to use to get to him. That feels a little bit overcomplicated. And obviously, you don't want to have Roddy McDowell fighting the brothers. But if they could have had like a more direct approach to get to him, where they could have maybe played off like his sense of humor playing off of their slapstick, I think could have been really good. But he was fantastic. He's probably one of my favorite parts of the film. He's the only one who's I think, really is bringing his A-game to the entire thing. That's what's impressive is that given this type of production, he did not phone it at all. I think, again, he has a lot of charm, a lot of class, and a lot of genuine menace. And even when he's being funny, there's a lot of genuine menace to just how flippantly he's killing his own people. Right. <laughs> when he fires like the first time he does it and you're just like oh he's fi oh my god they killed him and he just keeps going through this whole chain of people and then even the whole bit at the end where it's like him and all these people are giving a toast and champagne and four of them instantly keel over from the poison and there's a fifth guy who looks at his glass he's like oh i'm sorry that's right you don't drink and just shoots the guy in the head mm -hmm. i almost wish that they had been able to do a little bit more in the climax there's that great bit where David goes and he uses the shotgun to blow up the case full of diamonds. Mm -hmm. It would have been cool if he had like done that and all those diamonds like explode up into the bad guy's face, you know? Yeah. Instead, you just get this generic stalking around shadows until he shoots him. Yeah. Yeah. That was not the best ending to such a great actor's performance. Yeah. But again, it was a nice performance. Again, it makes up for just how generic the plot is by the fact that he's a very compelling antagonist just because he's so much fun to watch. I do wish that we had gotten a little more interplay between him and the brothers, because I do actually like the scene where he's torturing David for info, even though David's not the person who has any of the info. And then I do also like the scene where he's facing down the two brothers, there's all the spilled diamonds on the runway, and he's almost hypnotizing Peter with the lure of, are you really going to leave all these diamonds just sitting here? Help me, and most of this is yours, you know? And Peter, you know, the thief, is so drawn to this, and yet he still snaps out of it. <laughs> I like that moment. Yeah. That felt like a very Kurt Wimmer moment. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the fact that when he dies, there's all the glass that falls, and so it looks yes. like he's holding diamonds in his yes. hands. Somebody actually attempted some art here. Okay. Maybe not great art, but still, they tried, and they get a cookie for that. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I honestly think that's my biggest issue with John Paragon's direction is it just feels very cheap. There's a lot of things that he's trying to do that some of it works, some of it doesn't. There's so much bad Foley work. The action scenes are really badly done, Mm -hmm. especially the fights. They're not interesting. And there's so many bits where they can't even afford blanks. So the guns don't even have muzzle flashes as you just hear a badly Foley'd over gunshot from off screen. And we can't afford a squib. So then you'll just hear a thump from off screen too. Those things really do kind of cheapen the movie. Yeah, there's a few people who died from paint on their forehead. And I understand, like, this is not the type of movie that has the budget to do anything. Yeah, I'm fine with, like, the whole, oh, that's right, you don't drink, bang. And then you just see the guy with the hole in his head. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Because it fits the scene. But, like, the guy who got his neck cut, like, that looked like somebody just put putty on his neck. Dribbled a squirt bottle, yeah. Though I do love the whole bit of they literally trap a guy by putting a giant barbell on his chest. (laughs) That is so perfect for them. That was amazing. Yeah. That was so perfect. That was just, ugh, perfection. Now, did either of you recognize the actor playing Bob, the lead henchman of the villain? No, but did he play Bob in the Batman movie that Tim Burton did? No, that's not Bob the Goon. Aww. No, I did not. I recognized his face. I couldn't quite place it, but I did see in the credits Bill Mooney. And so I was like, oh, okay. That's Bill Mooney, Will Robinson from Lost in Space. And this was like right before Babylon 5 where he had a prominent role too. I just was really churned because I thought that was a really interesting against type bit of casting. Because even when we just see him as the goofy chauffeur in the opening scene, I was like, oh, is that Bill Mooney? Oh, hey. And then like Bill Mooney's name came up in the credits. I'm like, oh, hey, it's Bill Mooney. That'll be fun. Nice little cameo. And then he straight up kills a person. And then he just starts killing more and more people. And it's like, little Bill Moomy. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) It was such an unconventional casting choice. Danger. Yes. Danger, Will Robinson. Will Robinson is danger now. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's the next reboot after the current Netflix one. Well, Bill Moomy is in that as the real Dr. Smith. I did see that. Yes. I did not see that coming. And actually, my point of reference for him was the kid who wishes people into the cornfield. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because I just looked him up and I'm like, that's the kid? Well, now we know how he sent them out into the cornfield. Exactly. I didn't see that coming. And he was so joyful about, like, killing someone. I was just like, do you know what? You're, like, terrifying. But also, like, I dig it. I dig it. Yeah, it's a laid back, grinning Bill Moomy with a ponytail cast in a role that would usually be, like, Richard Keel or someone like that. (laughs) Actually, the last movie we watched, J.D., it was Richard Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It was, again, just a really clever bit of casting. It's like so catches you off guard, but then he really plays it well. They do some really fun bits with the character. Like he plays off of Roddy McDowell really nicely. And again, yeah, in all the scenes where he's killing people, it's like he's just having such a nice laid back fun time with it. And one thing, did I miss? Did we ever get a resolution for his character? Because he wasn't in the climax. He was shot by Whitney. He was shot by Whitney. That's right. That's Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Who then runs off and we never see him either again. Right. That's okay. I didn't miss Whitney. I didn't. Oh. That's fine. But JD, what did you think of Whitney? I, it, it's, it, <laughs> I'm sorry that Judge Reinhold was busy that day. <laughs> So instead, they got Colin Burnson, the literal brother of Corbin Burnson. I was like, that can't be Corbin Burnson. <laughs> little brother, yeah. Okay. He didn't look at all like Corbin. He was fine, I guess, as the nerdy agent. But it's one of those things where it wasn't a fleshed out enough role. He's not the constant third wheel or obstacle that they have to get around because he's the Fed who has to watch over Peter because they don't trust him. But basically, he just gets written out for like 90% of the movie until he finally comes back at the end to like save the day where they say thank you. And then they make fun of him as he trips and runs off to get the feds. Whitney was my favorite person in the movie. Oh, well, I'm sorry. (laughs) I liked again how it was kind of against type. I was like the first time you see him, you know, with that hair and that smile, you think, oh, who's this douchebag? And then you actually get to see him interacting with people. And it's like, oh, he's actually just this really upbeat, dorky, ridiculously optimistic person who just wants to help out and is fumbling and stumbling all over himself. It's like, I like it when things catch me off guard like that, where they set me up again, like what they do with Bill Moomy, where they set me up to expect one type of character and then suddenly reveal, oh, it's a completely different type of character. I like bits like how he gets knocked out. There's like, oh, he'll be fine. And then they just catch up with him like five hours later because he's still unconscious on the floor. And then he spends the rest of the film with his head wrapped in bandages. And then, yeah, that he shows up there again at the climax is surprisingly capable for a moment. They have their last exchange and then he trips all over himself as he's heading away. 
I like bits like that, or even the bit where he's having the conversation with Peter while they're taking a piss in the men's room, and he has no idea that Peter has just rigged up the toilet to sound like it's pissing as he's escaping. And then I love David catches Peter on the ground and forces him to climb back up in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that amuses me. That was sweet. Although I like the part where he's like, damn it, he's still alive. Yes. <laughs> it's like, God, you guys are being so mean to Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> also, if he's been knocked out for that long, like, he's horribly concussed, and you need to take him to the hospital. He's got a bandage on. What else are they going to do? Yeah. He has a brain injury. There's blood on his brain. He needs a scan. He probably forgot how to walk. <laughs> well, that's why he tripped all over himself. At the end. <gasps> oh, my God. They brought it back around. Yeah, oh, that, yeah. That was smart. Did not even see that. Yeah, it was deeply layered in there, yeah. Kurt Wimmer is layering things in that you didn't even catch the first time. You'll have no, to rewatch watch yeah. this film over and over again. That man crafts a puzzle. <laughs> Nolan-esque. So, Evie, what did you think about the cameo of David Carradine? They put him in the opening credits. I'm like, oh, David Carradine. And then I was like, oh, David Carradine, I'm sad. And then he's in it for a scene. I was just like, I don't know that I would have given you that big of a credit. It was a surprise, but he was barely there. I love the police badges work where you can literally just show your badge and you get into maximum security places. Is that not how that works? You guys still have to like sign for stuff and have appointments set up. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> My fake police badge that I bought is going to be useless then. <laughs> Disappointed. The fact that you said the same producers that did Think Big makes sense because I was like, why is David Carradine in two Barbarian Brothers movies? Maybe they just really got along. I guess it was like, maybe they became bros after this, but he really doesn't get anything. He basically just lays exposition down. Yeah. You kind of get the explanation that this was the guy that taught Peter all his criminal ways. But for the most part, he just explains like what the card is for and why everybody wants it. And that's it. And it feels like it's a waste of a good actor. Because, I mean, at least in, like, Think Big, he actually got to do stuff. Yeah, he actually had a pretty prominent supporting role throughout that. Yeah, this is just him just laying exposition, and he's fine in it, yeah. but he, this isn't a stretch of his acting skills by any stretch. No, and this is more your typical David Carradine, where he's just kind of quiet and whispery and looks half stoned. <laughs> Which, again, Evie, if you want a nice selling point on Think Big, you get to see David Carradine in an energetic, cartoony, over-the-top role. I, that sounds fake, but okay. <laughs> Have you ever seen David Carradine play something energetically in cartoony? Yeah, I'm trying to think back and I'm like, nothing. You guys have already sold me on it, so I'm going to have to watch it. <laughs> Evie, is there anything else you can think of that you want to bring up? Scotty. Jimmy Doohan. <laughs> yeah, what did you think about him in this? I know he was in the credit sequence, but he was so unexpected. I was just like, oh my God, Scotty, and I freaked out. That is so cute. Apparently, this is the first non-Star Trek film that he was in since 1971. Well, at least he was doing quality work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah JD, what did you think about seeing Jimmy doing? I always love Scotty. He was one of my favorite Star Trek people when I was a kid, so I'm always happy to see him in anything. He had not done much. And most of the time when he was in films, it was usually as, hey, remember Star Trek? Yeah. I felt so bad that he like basically became like a parody of himself. So I'm glad that he got a chance to actually play a real role. Yeah. That said, he's playing the police captain that's in every single cop movie. Like he gets angry and shouts at the cop and tells him that he has one more day to finish the case or whatever. You know, it's a very stereotypical role. Yeah, I agree with you. It's nice to see him do something that's not just putting a big spotlight on Star Trek. But every single time we see him, he's just sitting in that one chair in his office. So it feels like they only had him for four hours and they just filmed all of his shots. Yeah. And I think that's the problem is that, yeah, he's just a typical angry chief, but not an animated angry chief. I mean, because he's just sitting behind a desk the entire time. He's not like up on his feet storming around, barking at everyone. And I think when David lost his partner, they had a really good opportunity just to kind of brief a little heart to heart between him and the chief. And I think that could have been a nice touch had they gone that way. He does mention like, oh, the entire department grieves or something like that. And then immediately moves on to playing every angry police chief that you've ever seen. And I just realized he's playing Chief O'Brien, who was basically the Scotty of Next Gen in East Space Nine. Oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's intentional or not, but. Take that, Cole Meany. I kind of like the bits where they're going out for food and Peter's disgusted that David eats like these really sloppy burgers and David is disgusted that Peter likes to dress up and go to fancy restaurants. Yeah, it's typical chick, but they play it well. 
who almost gets a bit of the short shift is, of course, the early on killed partner of David, played by A.J. Johnson. Yeah. Who seemed like she could have been a really interesting character. Because, you know, they kind of do the undercover cop thing where she's dressed up like a prostitute. But instead of making it sexualized, it's more comedy about how she really hates having to wear these freaking platform shoes. Then she actually gets that really touching moment there where she goes to get some info from an informant and then finds him dead on the bench. It's just this little moment there. I wish they could have built on her character a bit more. But then, of course, then she's dead. So not only are we killing his partner, but we're killing his black woman partner. So it's kind of like fridging upon fridging. Yeah. I did notice the fact that she was the only woman character of note in the entire film. Yeah. All the other women are just Peter's arm candy. Right. Or like the cop who's selling Girl Scout cookies. Yeah. She does well with that scene in Mm -hmm. the station where she's saying, like, I'm just going to go meet with my informant. I'll be fine. I think she actually had some chemistry with David. Yeah. In fact, I actually thought that they might be like romantically involved because they show that picture of them together. I never got a romance vibe, but I just got this really close kinship, you know, this buddy vibe from them. Well, and I think we later see like her husband. Yeah, yeah. Because David promises to get the people who kill her, yeah. Right. She did good for like the few minutes that she's on screen. I just wish that either it had given her more to do or they had at least another female character who could actually do something. Yeah. Anything. I looked her up. A.J. Johnson, she seems like a really interesting person. She continues acting to this day. Not, not anything too huge or prominent, but she keeps acting. And she was one of the Fly Girls on In Living Color. So she is a professional dancer. She's also become one of the major fitness trainers in Hollywood, helping to sculpt a lot of the bodies of the stars. And so you have someone who not only is she giving these nice little moments or performance, but she's very physically adept. I think it would have been interesting to keep her involved in the plot and let her take part in the action sequences. And have like her basically having to babysit these two brothers who are babysitting each other through this entire plot could have been really interesting and I think could have maybe given a little more energy to the action sequences, which are still terribly choreographed, but I think she could have brought some energy to them. Yeah, and I really didn't understand why she got killed in the first place because they made the informant look like he'd overdosed and she goes like, oh, I thought you were clean. And then gets shot. I think the plot would have been better if you're going to kill her, which I still think was a mistake. Right. If they had saved that for when they are mistaking David for Peter and they're going after David to get the key card back. Right. I think that would have made for a much more interwoven plot that would have been easier to follow. Or like she's the only one who really knows that they're twins because she's the only one who trusts to tell them that. And So she's like the housekeeper in the parent trap. <laughs> yeah. And she has to be the one who has to explain what's going on to I don't know like it just could have done something more with her anything Mm -hmm. and again there's no other romantic interest in the movie I mean Peter has the one woman he's sleeping with in the beginning but again there's no other woman character in the movie other than bit parts I think David was really in love with his weight set because the grunts that he was making when he was lifting weights ooh man (laughs) and the woman on the other side of the wall I needed a cigarette after that yeah I kept expecting her to come back I was like she's gonna be like the love interest for him Nope. Evie, what did you think of the weightlifting sequence? I thought it was funny. (laughs) I get what they were going for. It was a little bit silly, but at the same time, I thought it was funny. But again, these guys, they aren't cut. They're like huge. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not even like the joking term thick. They are freaking thick. And what I also kind of love is how they cut from David doing his weightlifting and his whole sexual grunting and the woman listening to that. Cut to Peter, who's romantically weightlifting his love partner, basically, above his head. That was just a funny bit. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of surprised because the Barbarians didn't really have much of a romance plot, but I still thought the romance kind of worked in the last movie. So I don't think these guys are incapable of, you know, if you want to give them a love interest to explore. I think this is a film where it's like you can see the threads of what this film used to be. And they just kept evolving into something so completely different that none of the pieces all fit together that much anymore. Right. And then one thing I also want to mention, the music. JD, what do you think about the music? (laughs) It was the finest 1980s porno music I have heard all week. Most of it was weird. Like some of it really felt generic. They only had like a handful of tracks, so they kept falling back on the same music over and over again. And to be honest, nothing of it stood out that much other than it felt very cheap and kind of atonal for like what the film was at. Sometimes it felt really kind of goofy, like when they're in like an action scene. And other times it was, okay, yeah, this is kind of on point as far as like the tone of the scene, but nothing of it really stood out as being good. 
Oh, God. I thought it was like a cornucopia of 80 synth, and I was just here for it, like all of it. Again, I had a really good day, you guys, okay? <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> What was weird about it, and I looked up, the composer who did this movie has never done another movie before or since. That is a tragedy. Has never even worked on any movies at all. This is the one and only movie. But what was funny was it sounded like they were a beach band. It was literally just a drummer, a keyboardist, and a guitarist. And it sounded like they just found this beach band. And as the movie was playing for one session, they just had them riff. And they're just playing this generic beach rock music. It's perfectly fine music, but there's so many scenes where it's suddenly things are dramatic and you got the rock and beach music playing, or it's like someone just gets killed and the rock and beach music is playing. It's such an odd fit. And again, it feels like they literally just recorded this one stretch of music and then just left it as is. Listen, play that one stretch of music at my funeral. <laughs> amazing i love it this is being recorded by the way we will make sure this happens good i want it for posterity so that other people know this does count as your will and testament <laughs> yes it a hundred percent does also yes this and you know i have a whole list of things i want at my funeral my funeral is going to be like a endurance test for people coming to my funeral <laughs> duly noted <laughs> i will pack accordingly bring plenty of supplies earplugs definitely bring earplugs so yeah, but otherwise, I'm struggling to think of anything else in this movie. JD, you got anything else you want to bring up on it? This one was just okay film, but it's just out of all of the films that we've seen, Evie, if you liked this one, you're going to love Barbarians and Think Big. So look forward to those. Yeah, if you think this one is great, those are going to be stupendous. Oh yeah, no, I'm going to have like a good time with these, I think. If I don't, I'm going to be very upset with myself and be like, what's wrong with me? I'm Buzz Killington normally, and I'm like, this is amazing. I'm surprising myself, and I'm happy to surprise myself. I honestly think for the fullest context, Evie, you and I need to sit down one day and double feature this in Equilibrium. I don't know if Equilibrium is going to be as good as this. <laughs> what if Equilibrium had starred the Barbarian Brothers? <gasps> don't make me want things I can't have, Noel. It's mean. That is mean. <laughs> what if Ultraviolet had starred the Barbarian Brothers? Okay, well then that would have gone straight to the top of my charts instead of me going, I'm confused and I don't care. <laughs> What I'm thinking about is other films. What if Thomas Crown Affair had started the <laughs> <gasps> Yes. What is Sphere? What if Michael Crichton's Sphere had started the Barbarian Brothers? Just, you keep saying things and it's like, yes. But what's funny is it's interesting that we're seeing them try out the Barbarian Brothers in a different type of movie, but it only really works by bringing it back to what makes the Barbarian Brothers work. I mean, I think you could make a grittier action movie that does star the Barbarian Brothers and have it work. I think it would need a better director than what you have here. Uh, you give him to Rennie Harlan, you'll have a real good time. Mm -hmm. I just don't think the talent involved was right here. And I think maybe they grabbed the wrong script. Yeah, I agree with that. I could see the pieces for a really good film that would have been better than like Barbarians or Think Big. Yeah. Using this concept with these brothers. Yeah, even just that great concept. One's a cop, one's a crook. Right. And play that off each other. And the bad guys are looking for the cop or whatever. That's a fine concept. I understand that they probably had no budget, but I think even with no budget, you could have done something more with this concept. It just didn't quite ever come together right. as much as I would have liked. Well, and the way it feels to me is they had their script, but then they shifted a lot of it through onset improv. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It feels like a lot of these individual sequences were built on the fly. And I think this was a project where you really needed to strip it down and rebuild it for these guys. And again, going in ways that we've already explored. You're as dumb as I look. Yeah. That feels like something that we would have heard in the other two movies. Yeah. Like, it just feels like that was probably some on-set riffing by them. I even just love the whole bit of they have the setup of they flip the guy's car over, and then you get to the climax where they flip the guy's plane over. <laughs> <laughs> and then the pilot is still inside the plane, hanging upside down, and he still manages to shoot one of them. And the other guy goes, are you okay? No, I'm not okay. i just been shot. <laughs> <laughs> The Barbarian Brothers, if you've never seen their films, if you only see some photos, it's like, I get why you can be very dismissive of them. 
but they were legitimate performers and they have legitimate charisma and energy and a good shtick and bounced off each other well. They were very dedicated. I don't want to say dedicated to the craft, but they literally are putting work in to their performances. And you can see that and it reflects. And it's again, I think, had there been more time to properly build this around the brothers, I think it would have worked better. But as it is, I'm still regretting that we only have one film left. I know. Do you know what? I kind of wish that this was like a TV series. It would have so worked as a TV series. Yeah, I could see that. Well, and we even talked about that back in our DC Cab episode, which I know, Evie, you haven't heard, but DC Cab was their film debut where it's them running around with Mr. T. And I'm like, God, if A-Team wasn't already on the air, if you had just had Mr. T and the Barbarian Brothers open a detective agency together and just run with it... (gasps) We could just do that now. Someone start a GoFundMe now. Again, the Barbarian Brothers are two of the most unique talents to have ever become film stars. And it's kind of a shame that the industry never fully appreciated how best they could be used. Or how to play to their strengths. Exactly. It's disappointing. So that's going to end our episode on Double Trouble. We got one more. One more left. We'll get to you next month. But yeah, we're almost done. I think we are still going to do a fifth episode. We're kind of doing like a little odds and ends and overview type thing, but I'm still trying to see what all I can pull together on that one. So we'll see where we're going. But yeah, I'm going to miss the Barbarian Brothers. I already miss them. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you for joining us, Evie. It was a delight. Thank you. I legitimately had no idea what you were going to think about this movie, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. I watched it on like the perfect day to watch it. And so uh, <laughs> I'm now on Amazon. Oh my God. Yes, it is on DVD. Yeah. Double Trouble is available on DVD and The Barbarians is available on DVD. I think Think Big and Twin Sitters are a little harder to find. Granted, all three of them are on YouTube. So. <laughs> I would just like to point out that a whole bunch of movies that suck are on DVD and Blu-ray, but I can't get Twin Sitters. I just (laughs) look at your life, universe. Look at your choices. You know what legitimately shocks me? They only have, even setting aside DC Cab, they've only had four films where they are the stars, and yet there is not a four-film box set collection of the Barbarian Brothers. Right? I would pay money for that. Come on. It can't be that hard to assemble the rights to these movies. They cannot be that expensive. Shout Factory, I am looking at you. Yeah, I was going to say, write your local Shout Factory. Shout Factory is already the ones who put out the Barbarians in a double feature DVD with the Norsemen, a Lee Majors movie that has nothing to do with the Barbarian Brothers. Do a four-piece Barbarian Brothers box set, Shout Factory, please, for the good of all. Ooh, hello. I like that Shout Factory has a contact us part. Ooh. Ooh. I do like it that they have that on their website. I'm going to email them. So all listeners to this show, please write Shout Factory. They'll receive at least two emails. (laughs) I can email them many times. (laughs) <laughs> many times from different aliases. I think we know who's going to be responsible for the Barbarian Brothers DVD pack that's going to eventually come out. It's going to be me. Criterion, this is an important <laughs> era of cinema that needs to be preserved. They put out a Lena Dunham movie. I think they can do the Barbarian Brothers. Yeah. So like Criterion does not get to be all high and mighty about this. Hey, if they can put together a Zatoichi box set, they can do a Barbarian Brothers box set. 4K remasters. Right? I want that. Film historian commentaries on all of them. I will pay your $400 or whatever it is now. Especially if the film historian is Joe Bob Briggs, because that'll be fun. Anyways, I think that's going to bring our episode to a close. Thank you for joining us, Evie. Thank you for having me. Now I need to go watch all the other movies that they've been in. (laughs) And then find them on Instagram and Twitter and just be like, yes, life complete. (laughs) And JD, good night. (laughs) Good night. Our Brilliance is a part of Schumacast, which can be found at schumacast.blogspot.com and on Stitcher. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. The music in this episode is Stars by Jack Locke and is used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Our Brilliance and Schumacast are in no way affiliated with the creators and copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. A lot of like character actor types, at least every one of them made an impact as opposed to here where it's like Jimmy Duan and Bill Mooney and David Carradine. And then uh, there's the cop lady. Yeah. And that's about it. Hey, remember the guard in the building who we got to see the butt crack of? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I forgot butt crack guard. I love that guy. (laughs) 
Can we change that on his IMDb listing to Butt Crack Guard? God, yes, I hope so. Butt Crack Guard is the sidekick of Crop Top Cop. <gasps> yes! And they have to go get information from Booty Short Bouncer. <laughs> and then also they're competing against Thigh High Private Eye. <laughs> you need to copyright all of this and make so much money. 